The Holy Childhood of Archbishop John Maximovich, published in 1974. In our times of feeble Christian life, we hardly even dream of seeing the strength of true Orthodox character in a child. Here, then, is an example of this from almost our own times, the childhood of a 20th century wonder worker, as gathered from eyewitnesses of it, principally his own brother and sister who are still alive. The birthplace of Archbishop John was the warm, blossoming land of the Kharkov region in southern Russia. Here, in the estate of Adamovka, in the illustrious noble family of Maximovich, on June 4, 1896, a son was born to the parents Boris and Glafira. In holy baptism he was named Michael, in honor of the holy archangel of God. From of old the Maximovich family had been famous throughout Russia for its piety and patriotism. The most illustrious member of this family was a saint glorified by the church, the holy hierarch John, metropolitan of Tobolsk, a well-known spiritual writer and poet, translator of the Heliotropion, or coordination of the human will with a divine will missionary to Siberia who sent the first Orthodox mission to China, and who, especially after his repose, poured forth a multitude of miracles for the faithful. He was canonized in 1916, and his incorrupt relics are preserved even to this day in Tobolsk. Although the Holy Hierarch John died at the beginning of the 18th century, yet his spirit rested in his distant nephew, who was to receive his name in monasticism, and the young Michael, or Misha, as he was called for short, from earliest childhood was a remarkable boy. Misha's grandfather on his father's side was a prominent landowner of the area, and his grandfather on his mother's side was a doctor in Kharkov. His father held a position of leadership among the nobility, and his uncle, his father's brother, who edited the Heliotropion of St. John of Tobolsk, was rector of the university in Kiev. A similar worldly career seemed to be in store for the boy Michael also. His relationship to his parents was always excellent, and he took their opinions into serious consideration as long as they lived. They died in Venezuela, his mother in 1952, and his father in 1954. As a boy, Misha Maximovich was sickly and ate little, he was very quiet and gentle. He strove to be on good terms with everyone, but he had no especially close friends. He loved animals, and dogs in particular. He did not like noisy children's games, and was often in a very pensive frame of mind. The outstanding characteristic of his childhood was his deep religiousness, which he manifested in ways far beyond his years. In his sermon on being consecrated bishop in 1934, he himself said, From the first days when I began to become aware of myself, I wished to serve righteousness and truth. My parents kindled in me a striving to stand unwaveringly for the truth, and my soul is captivated by the example of those who had given their lives for it. Young Misha loved to play monastery dressing toy soldiers as monks and making toy forts into monasteries. As he grew older, his religious fervor deepened. He collected icons and religious and historical books, amassing a large library, and he loved above all to read the lives of the saints. At night, he would stand for a long time at prayer. Being the oldest child, he had a great influence on his four brothers and one sister, who knew the lives of the saints and the facts of Russian history through them. He was very demanding of himself and others in keeping the church's laws and national customs. From his earliest years, he was a fervent Russian patriot, and he instilled in others also a reverence for Russia and its history. His love extended likewise to all the Slavic and Orthodox peoples, and in 1912, when the Serbs were betrayed by the Bulgarians, in righteous indignation, he removed the pictures of the Bulgarian king from the younger children's scrapbooks and sealed up the family's phonograph record of the Bulgarian national anthem so that it could not be played. Misha's holy and righteous childhood greatly impressed his French Catholic governess, and it was under his influence that she was baptized Orthodox 
when the boy was 15 years old. He helped to prepare her for baptism and taught her how to pray. He took an active part in church life, and every year he would participate in the procession of the wonder-working Ozeryansk icon of the Most Holy Mother of God, from Kharkov to the Ozeryansk Monastery. The Maximovich country estate in Bear Valley was located only eight miles from the famous Zvyatogorsky Monastery. The family spent every summer at their estate, and young Misha would sleep outdoors in a tent. The family had great reverence for the monastery and spent much time there. It can be imagined what awe and fervor was inspired in Misha's eager heart when he came as a pilgrim to this remarkable monastery, which was situated on a forested bank of the northern Donets. It had an Athenite typicon, majestic churches, a high Mount Tabor, many caves, schema monks, skeets, and a large brotherhood of 600 monks, enough to inflame the zeal of any young lover of the lives of the saints. Misha, a monk from childhood, was immensely impressed, and he would often come to the monastery by himself. When he was 11 years old, Misha was sent to the Poltava Cadet Corps, Military Academy, which his father had attended. Here he continued to be quiet and religious and not at all like a soldier. He did well in all subjects and liked them all, with the exception of physical education, from which he was excused in his last years. While he was attending the Cadet Corps, at the age of 13, Misha was guilty of a serious breach of conduct, which is extremely revealing of his character as a boy. The cadets would often march formally in the city of Poltava, and in 1909, on the occasion of the 200th anniversary of the Russian victory in the Battle of Poltava, they were marching with special solemnity. As they passed by the front of the Poltava Cathedral, Cadet Michael turned toward the cathedral and made the sign of the cross. The boys laughed, and later they mocked him for this, and he was disciplined by the authorities for it. Finally, the Grand Prince Konstantin Konstantinovich, patron of the corps, whose son was a fellow cadet of Misha's, issued the order that Cadet Michael Maximovich was not to be punished for an act which, far from being reprehensible and deserving of censure, was most praiseworthy and revealed sound religious feelings. Misha, from an object of ridicule, became a hero. In 1914, Michael graduated from the cadet corps and following the deep desire of his heart, he wished then to attend the Kiev Theological Academy. His parents insisted, however, that he attend law school in Kharkov, and out of obedience to them he put away his own desire and began to prepare for a career in law. It was during his university years that the orthodox education and outlook which he had received in his childhood came to maturity in the youth Michael. At an age when some boys who are raised unconsciously orthodox are rebelling or even discarding the fairy tales of their religious upbringing, young Michael understood the point of this upbringing. He saw that the lives of saints, in particular, contain a profound wisdom which is unsuspected by those who read them superficially, and that the proper knowledge of them is more important than any university course. And so it was, as his classmates noticed, that Michael spent more time reading the lives of the saints than attending academic lectures, although he did very well in his university studies also. He studied the Orthodox saints precisely on the university level. He assimilated their world outlook and their orientation toward life, entered into their psychology, studied the variety of their activity and ascetic labors and practice of prayer. He came to love them with all his heart, was thoroughly penetrated by their spirit, and began to live like them. While studying the worldly sciences, he said in the sermon mentioned above, I went all the more deeply into the study of the science of sciences, into the study of the spiritual life. He put all his effort into this, and his spiritual eyes became fully open, and his soul was wounded with the thirst to acquire the true meaning and path of life in Christ. 
The boy Michael came to an age of a man and finished his university studies just as the fearful revolution was beginning its course with the intent to subject the whole world to anti-Christianity. His whole family was intensely loyal to the Orthodox Tsar, and for it the very first days of the February Revolution in 1917 were days of mourning. And Michael, now thoroughly penetrated with the principles of Orthodox life according to the example of God's saints, was especially bold in continuing to live by the standard of Orthodox sanctity, even in the midst of the new conditions of life. Thus, at a church meeting in Kharkov, there was talk of taking down a silver bell in the cathedral belfry and melting it. The vast majority, caught up in the revolutionary spirit or fearful of opposing it, were in favor of this sacrilege, and only Michael and a very few others dared to speak out boldly against this. As the revolutionary spirit spread and the arrests began, his boldness became very dangerous, and his family tried to persuade him to leave home and hide himself. He only replied that there is nowhere to hide from God's will. Without God's will, nothing happens. Not one hair falls from our head. He was arrested, then released after a month. After a short time, he was arrested again. But when it was seen that he seemed not to care whether he was free or in prison, he was soon released again. Already he quite literally lived in another world and he simply refused to conform to the reality that governs the lives of most men. He had resolved to follow unwaveringly the path of God's law. Thus, the seed of true orthodoxy planted in his childhood took deep root in the soil of the heart of this chosen one of God, and his knowledge and love of the different kinds of saints prepared his soul to become, as it were, a wondrous new plant with marvelous and varied fruits seldom to be seen together in one person. As his life later revealed, he was at one and the same time a stern ascetic and a loving pastor, a feeder of orphans and unmercenary healer, and a missionary and apostle, a profound theologian and a fool for Christ's sake, a true shepherd of his banished Russian flock, and a hierarch of universal significance. Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, of the Holy Hierarch John, wonder worker of Shanghai and San Francisco, O Lord Jesus Christ our God, have mercy on us. Amen.